Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at 8 things we've learned about Total War Warhammer 3 from the recent gameplay event featuring a battle between Kislev and Korn. I'll be doing a deeper dive into all of the units we've seen later this week, and the two new battle modes that have been discussed later today, but with this video, I want to touch on a variety of elements that don't categorize neatly. Before we dive in, I just want to say thanks to the folks over at Creative Assembly for inviting me to this event and giving me the opportunity to take a look and then showcase the game to you as well. I look forward to doing it many more times in the lead up to release, so go ahead and subscribe if you're looking for more info as it comes. And if you want to grab the game for yourself, doing so at the link in the description and pinned comment down below helps support the channel if you'd like to do that. With all that said, let's dive in. Split Chaos Rosters Chaos Gods will have their own factions each, we've known this for a while now, but what we've had confirmed as of this latest event is that each Chaos Gods faction will contain two classes of units that behave quite differently in a few ways. Much like the Tomb Kings have constructs and regular units, Chaos units will be split as demonic and regular, or mortal if you will. Regular units act just like regular units from any other faction we've seen before. They take damage like normal to health and morale, they fight, they break, they rally, they break, they rally, they break, and then they're rout. Unless the numbers have changed since I last checked, that is. With demonic units, however, we're going to see three traits get applied across the board. Instability, Banished, and Physical Resistance. I don't know if the 20% value for Physical Resistance is just for corn, with different percentages across the four gods, but they'll all have that resistance to a degree, so when you look at any Chaos Demon stats, keep that in mind. Low melee defense and low armor are boosted by that physical resistance. Apart from that though, as I mentioned, we have instability and banished. The former acts like crumbling does for undead units, chipping away at health when leadership is below a certain threshold, and the latter acts like disintegration, again dealing massive amounts of damage when leadership crosses below a greater minimum threshold. This means that demonic units will never run away from battle, and as long as you can keep their morale up, they can be used to hold a line, harass, or otherwise block access. If not just, you know, deal out damage for that little bit longer while they stay engaged as they die away. I had a feeling we'd see demonic units be unlikely to rout in the traditional sense, and this is a great approach, allowing the roster to feature mortals who, again when bested and perhaps forsaken by even corn, will flee while demons get removed from this plane of existence. God-specific unit and trait details. Predictably, each of the four Chaos Gods are getting their own faction, as we've discussed before, and each of the four Chaos Gods plays differently, of course. Korn comes in with no ranged units, only featuring aggressive melee combatants, forgoing magic, of course, and including spell resistance. Now, unless I'm mistaken, this is a renaming of magic resistance, and it begs the question why? Is magic damage separate from spell damage? Or is it just a renaming for the sake of renaming? Horn aside, Nurgle has slower moving troops that are more durable, and he'll have an entire lore of magic that synergizes with his troop mix. Lanesh, meanwhile, is going to be more of a glass cannon, fragile but fast and deadly. I wasn't able to get any details on Cinch. I guess it's not yet set in stone. I guess you could say it's all still likely to change. Apart from that, the unit naming convention quite clearly implies that we're going to be seeing variants of certain units. Furies, for example, specify there for Korn in the battle we played. That would imply that they will also come as Nurgle, Slanesh, and Siege variants too. We can see, for example, that Chaos Warhounds are just called Chaos Warhounds without any specificity, which means they'll probably be generic across all the gods, whereas other units do specify, again, just to reiterate, implying they'll exist in multiple forms, one for each god. Now extrapolating from that, we can expect Chaos Warriors dedicated to each of the gods as well, and I imagine we'll see them with similar variants such as Halberd or Double Weapon, though they'll have different stats or traits, or at least that's what's been implied by the developers so far. The demons will of course be different between the gods, but I'm glad to see that the uh, mortal units will be different in various ways too, beyond just the aesthetic I mean. And we know at least one way they'll be different. Faction-specific battle mechanics. They're still in. All we know of so far have to do with Kislev and Korn, and I'll be honest, I was a little concerned at first when I didn't see any visual indication playing as Kislev, 
but then I realized that all of their units had by our blood, a buff to leadership when hit points cross a threshold. This feels a lot like martial prowess except a little flipped. And I'll be honest, this isn't my favorite type of faction battle mechanic. It's a little plain when compared to the Warhammer 2 DLC factions or the reworked factions for Warhammer 2 as well. Consider the reworked WA or the uh, Realm of Souls. Also simple systems really just fill a bar to unlock things, but at least there's layers to them. The simple on-off switch like we have here or like the High Elves got feel very mild in comparison and to me it sets the bar a little low so that future DLC can make us go, oh wow, look at these cool mechanics, the DLC factions are so good, they're totally worth however many dollars. But my cynicism aside and my pragmatic business sense aside, it's good to see the systems are still in place. I really like that in game 2 and I was a little worried that they would be set aside for game 3, but no, they do exist. It also looks like ornate units, or at least the ones with Hellblades, like the Bloodletters, have certain mechanics that only trigger when a unit crosses certain kill count thresholds. Very fitting for Korn, and this isn't even the faction mechanic. With these noted, what do you think the other faction mechanics might be? I suspect, you know, everything Korn does has to do with kill counts and kill numbers. I've already got a speculation video out about the Korn faction, so you can watch that for my thoughts, but I want to know what you think. And with regards to the other gods, I mean, I suspect Nurgle will involve some kind of, you know, regeneration. Might actually be quite similar to the Realm of Souls, ending with the summoning of a great unclean one, or maybe something a bit smaller than that, I guess. Slanesh would likely center around speed and melee attack and defense stats, and Sinch will maybe have access to wilder and wilder spells on crossing certain thresholds. Cathay might also focus on melee attack or defense stats. They're a bit more of an unknown, but now I'm speculating. I'd love to hear what you think would be possible, or better yet, what kind of mechanics you'd actually like to see. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. Two new lores of magic. We know of at least two new lores of magic, and I wouldn't be surprised to see more come. The first of the two new lores is the lore of ice. It comes with a lore attribute, Frost Shield, that helps boost armor and missile block chance. Crystal Sanctuary is an augment to massively buff damage resistance at the expense of mobility. Frost Blades augments melee attack and damage stats, the Ice Maiden's Kiss is a breath spell, Death Frost causes direct damage on a target, though whether it's best used against multi-entity or single entity units is yet to be known for sure. Ice Sheet is a hex that can be used to slow the enemy down significantly, either preventing them from hitting a weak unit or preventing them from escaping a precarious situation. And finally, Heart of Winter is a heavy duty damage dealer in an area of effect working over four 8 second phases, causing a speed reduction as well as the aforementioned damage. A pretty well rounded lore of magic, though the numbers might be tweaked between now and release of course. Apart from that, there was also the briefest mention of a lore for Nurgle's faction, specifically that there is a lore that synergizes well with his slow, durable troops. Does that mean it will give them even more longevity with some replenishment spells? I imagine so. But might we also see things that increase speed to counteract the, you know, sort of pre-existing slow speed? We'll almost definitely have direct damage spells with Nurgle causing enemies to decay, but maybe a way to slow enemy troops down too? I'd be shocked if Tsinch doesn't get his own lore of magic as well, but we don't know for sure yet, so I'll leave that speculation for later. Big UI revamps always one of my favorite things to talk about, the UI is getting some updates. Unit tiers are very clearly communicated on the unit info card, and you can now collapse and open the sections of the unit card as well if you want to focus on one thing or another. Status effects are nicely placed away from the jumble at the bottom now too, really helping with legibility. You can see how long a status effect is going to last very easily, and you can get a much, much quicker read on what's actually active on a unit at any given time. On which note, the unit cards at the bottom communicate a lot more too. If a unit is braced, on fire, or god knows what else. Apart from the usual, of course, walking, running, and melee, we've seen that before. But even just knowing when a unit is braced makes such a big difference. I'm surprised it took this long for it to be included in the unit cards. I'm glad that it finally is. The Winds of Magic might also look slightly different to you. If I've understood it right, I much prefer this layout to the old one. Shaped like an hourglass, the top half tells you the reserve that will be available throughout the battle, and the bottom half tells you how much you have access to at the moment. This is a 
much clearer way to communicate your potential magic output over the course of a battle, and you can much more easily tell where you stand as far as your reserve is concerned. As far as the spells themselves, the use of iconography is top-notch where applicable, and since there are more heavy-duty spells right off the bat doing a lot more complicated stuff, it's nice to see the information using visual cues where possible. It's no big deal for those who are familiar with the game and familiar with the spells, but anybody who's new to it or otherwise unfamiliar playing a new faction, playing a new lore, they're going to have a much easier time just reading what the spells do based on those icons or you know, the, the, the targeting icon, for example, or the duration icon when the game wants to say map wide, just using that infinity symbol. Just small details, I know, but they can make a world of difference when you're trying to win a battle with quick glances and quick reminders of what all of your spells do. And I expect these same design changes, these same sort of design philosophies will carry on to, you know, bound spells, items, and anything else that has a pop-up like this as well. Finally, character levels are clearly displayed on the battlefield as well now, letting you know when you're biting off more than you can chew or when you're up against an easily overwhelmed character. It's a quick way to read what you can expect as far as upgrades to a character are concerned, and I wonder if this will be used to communicate anything else in multiplayer too. The prominence of these numbers also tells me that character levels might play a more important role than before. Maybe it's a bit more integral to how the campaign plays out. I've previously suggested that as you level up, there will be more important decisions as far as alignments are concerned and things like that, so I just wonder this has to be here for more reasons than just letting players know the, the level across the board. There's got to be some some extra flavor or, or layer to this. I'm just not sure what it might be, but this prominence, well, it's prominent, right? It's also just possible that Creative Assembly feels like it's always been important and it should be displayed properly, but they just now got the opportunity to implement it. And I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of its aesthetic. Uh, it sticks out a little, like a sore thumb. The typography specifically is what needs just a little bit of work. It needs a bit more space around it for double digits especially, but now I'm nitpicking. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be lots of changes on the campaign map too, and I cannot wait to explore those, but that's for later. It's just, it's great to see that these quality of life changes are happening, and I can't wait to see what they do similarly for the campaign map. Now, on the topic of the campaign map, unit equipment upgrades. Armor upgrades, Shield upgrades, weapon upgrades. Could it be? Are they actually going to be universally available across all factions as they should be? The implication from the devs was that these types of upgrades are available at a campaign level, and though the survival battle allows you to upgrade said equipment mid-battle, those upgrades don't come with you after the battle ends. You'll notice the question mark at the end of this subheading, and that's because the devs weren't crystal clear on this, and I want to make sure to communicate that. I didn't have the opportunity to clarify, unfortunately, but it certainly seems as though there's some system in place to track bronze, silver, and gold level upgrades for weapons, armor, and shields, and again, a campaign level implementation was implied. 8th edition with Wiggle Room One thing I was personally very curious about was how the return to the old world by Games Workshop would impact the working relationship between them and Creative Assembly. We got some absolutely amazing results with the Vampire Coast, and Alostra was a completely custom-built character with fresh lore written right at Creative Assembly. Could we possibly see more of that? Well, evidently, the end of 8th edition is still the reference point for the game, and the return to the old world by a Games Workshop will supposedly not be influencing the approach here. We're definitely seeing visual upgrades compared to some of the 8th edition models, but as far as lore and characters are concerned specifically, it looks like 8th edition is the source material. Games Workshop has established outlines for all the characters for the established factions, and that has been faithfully recreated in the game. This still very much leaves room open for another Solostra. It leaves room for exploration as far as new characters are concerned, and new factions too. Maybe I'm reading between the lines too much, maybe I'm holding on to hope for Araby and Ind and Nippon and Koresh a little too strongly, but let's be pragmatic again. If there's money to be made with a certain DLC, it's likely to happen. Inevitably. So I think there's still room, despite 
focusing on the 8th edition source material, I think there's still room in how the questions were answered by the devs to see Creative Assembly come up with new characters, new factions, new units, new everything, of course with Games Workshop's blessing. Time will tell. Grass. No, I'm not joking. Yes, I'm serious. But also, yes, when I hit 7 points, I decided I kind of wanted to get an 8th point to make a proper Chaos Stars worth of points in the video. But, jokes aside, it might sound minor, but hear me out. I asked the devs if there was anything they were particularly excited to share, and the fancy new GPU-driven grass generation was brought up. Now, on the one hand, I'm excited to see that in action because, I'm again, I'm not exaggerating, but bad grass will pull me right out of a landscape in a video game, especially when you're trying to get a nice cinematic shot. But also, on the other hand, are they talking about Troy-style grass? The grass in Troy was amazing. The way it crumpled under soldiers and chariots, the tracks that were left behind, it was, it was beautiful. But that's not the only interesting thing Troy did. And if the grass can be ported, what else can be ported? They're built on the same engine, but, you know, variants of the same engine, don't forget that. But development cycles and timings... They all had me wondering what of Troy's features might we see in Warhammer, if any. We already know we're getting improved sieges, and I do quite like Troy's lighting too, though it doesn't compare to Three Kingdoms. But what stands out most to me is how vehicles could be destroyed separately from their riders in Troy. There are definitely characters that could use that kind of mechanic in Warhammer. Units that, when separated from their mounts, might have certain effects applied to them, might behave differently. Yes, the comment from the dev was about grass, and I'm excited to see the visual upgrades in Warhammer 3. It does look quite gorgeous even without grass in Korin's realm, but if this opens the door to some of the interesting Troy battle mechanics, we could see some very cool new terrain types, we could see better differentiation between heavy, medium, and light units, and we could see better utilization of the battle maps in general. Troy had some of my favorite battle maps. Whatever your opinion may be about Troy as a whole, it's undeniable that it did some interesting stuff on the battlefield that deserved to be ported over. Now, were these all necessarily new things done for the first time ever? No, but they were done in recent Total War history, which means that they've been thought about, they might be re-implemented, and we might see them in Warhammer 3. I'm excited for that. Now, is it too late for some of this stuff to be ported over? We didn't see any mention of weight classes, for example, in the battle we played? Is it maybe being reserved for post-launch updates or for a specific faction that's, you know, infantry-focused? I'm not sure, but give me the grass, yes, but also give me the mud, the cliffs, the shattered chariots, and all else you have to offer. There's also one more thing I was going to include in this video, but talking about the two newly revealed battle modes will take quite a bit of time, and this video is getting long enough, so I've prepared a separate video focusing on everything we know about those, and that video will be releasing shortly, just later today, so hang in there. You'll find a link to the playlist of all of my Total War Warhammer 3 videos in the description down below and in the pinned comment. If you keep an eye on that, you'll, you'll see that video when it comes up, uh, but of course you can subscribe as well, and you'll get a notification if you hit the bell button. But there you have it, folks. Eight things we've learned about Total War Warhammer 3 from this recent Battle at the Brass Citadel. Things are shaping up promisingly, and you can expect me to dig deeper and deeper into the game as we get closer to release. Like I said earlier, if you'd like to keep up with the game, make sure to subscribe to the channel to follow along. And remember, if you grab the game at the link in the description and pinned comment down below, you'll support the channel as you do. As always, a Massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. They'll keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.